Welcome to the Masculine Wilderness Podcast. I'm your host, Tom Perez. As the founder and CEO of Epic Project, an organization dedicated to disrupting the demand for sexual exploitation, I'm so grateful that you're joining us today. We have a very special episode for you, and not just because it's our inaugural episode, but because our guest is one of the most giving, resilient, and powerful women I've ever had the pleasure to speak with in almost 15 years of working in the anti-trafficking movement. Her name is Elizabeth Smart, and during this episode, you're going to hear from Elizabeth, you're going to hear us talk a little bit about her story, but also about the work she's doing today to end the victimization and exploitation of sexual assault through education, healing, and advocacy. Now, if you don't know Elizabeth's story, here's a synopsis taken from her website. The abduction of Elizabeth Smart was one of the most followed child abduction cases of our time. Elizabeth was abducted from her home at the age of 14 on the night of June 5th, 2002, and for the next nine months, her captors controlled her by threatening to kill her and her family if she ever tried to escape. Fortunately, her grueling imprisonment ended on March 12, 2003, when an observant and courageous bystander took action, alerting police and ultimately leading her to a safe return to her family. Then Elizabeth triumphantly and courageously testified before her captors and the world about the, of the very private nightmare she suffered during her abduction, which led to their convictions. Through this traumatic experience, Elizabeth has become an advocate for change related to child abduction, recovery programs, and national legislation. She's helped promote the International Amber Alert System, the Adam Walsh Child Protection and Safety Act, and other safety legislation to help prevent abductions. She's the founder of the Elizabeth Smart Foundation. Now, while Elizabeth did not experience human trafficking during her horrific ordeal, she possesses unique knowledge of the victimization and healing that applies to anyone who's ever experienced trauma at this level, including survivors of exploitation and trafficking. Elizabeth's story, like that of every other victim of sexual violence, forces us to ask hard questions. Questions like how? How could something like this happen? Why? Why do men inflict so much pain through sexual violence? And what? What needs to change in our world so that there are fewer stories like Elizabeth's to tell? These are big questions, and it feels like searching for answers leads us into some very unfamiliar territory, kind of like a wilderness. So let's explore this together. Now, one important note before we begin, some of the topics we're going to discuss in this episode will no doubt be challenging to hear. There's mention of abduction, rape, sexual abuse, and human trafficking. And while it's never our aim on this podcast to delve into graphic depictions of these topics, we do discuss them as part of our work to eradicate abuse and exploitation. Please remember to take care of yourself while you're listening. And also know that by the end of the episode, you are going to be inspired by Elizabeth, her triumphant story, her foundation, and her hopes for the future. Thanks for listening to the Masculine Wilderness Podcast, and welcome, Elizabeth Smart. Elizabeth Smart, it's really just an honor to, to get to talk to you today. I'm really pleased that uh, you've just willing to take the time. I also want to admit that your reputation, the work you do, is pretty solid. Our work, oftentimes kind of in parallel spaces, but you've been doing this work a long time and it really matters. I'm really excited to hear about what you do, but also what brought you there. So thank you for taking the time to be with us today. I wanted to begin by just having you share a little bit about your story, the thing that really kind of propelled you into the work that you've been doing for your whole adult life, really. After we first talked, it's been a couple months now, I think I, I got a copy of your, I think this is the first book, is that right? This is the first yeah. one. And as I was reading it, I realized, like I have known my, you know, most of my adult life, like I've known about your story and it was happening, your 
just a little bit older, I think, than my oldest daughter. And I remember when the story happened. And I remember, you know, this was obviously long before social media and in the proliferation of the internet and all of that. But I remember hearing so many news stories about it. We were living in Southern California at the time. No, actually, I think we were in the Pacific Northwest, but I didn't want to know about it. I remember just like as a dad, I had three young daughters and, and the way, the way you share your story in the book, it touches on every, every fear, you know, that, that parents have about their kids. Obviously, you don't need to give us the 200 some page version of your story. <laughs> just share a little bit about that story. Yeah. I lived in what you would class a very safe neighborhood. I grew up in a place where like the neighborhood kids would get together and play night games. So like kick the can or hide and go seek or sardines almost every summer night. That's what we did. And that's what we looked forward to. And it felt like we knew most of our neighbors and everyone seemed pretty friendly. I mean, we all, for the most part, went to the same church. There were like neighborhood parties. So it felt like we were a pretty close-knit community. And as far as I knew, I had never heard really of anything bad happening. I mean, maybe people just didn't talk about the bad things going on in their life. Maybe we're a bit more uh, vulnerable to share like hard things in our life today than we were back then. But as far as I knew, like my childhood, like, yes, it wasn't perfect, but it was pretty idyllic. Like I came from a great family. I never questioned whether or not I was loved. I mean, I never went without. And I don't think any of us ever imagined that anything truly terrible could happen to us, at least not on the scale or magnitude that it eventually did. Mm -hmm. I remember I was about to finish my junior high experience, which pretty difficult time all around for any kid. I mean, Agreed. puberty, I don't think is nice for anyone, especially girls. Agreed. Well, boys too, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I remember being really excited about high school, just really excited about the future. And I went to bed one night, like totally at comfort, not concerned, not worried, didn't have a clue anything bad was going to happen. And I think when you hear when as a child, when people talk to you about like kidnapping happens, at least for me, it felt like it was, oh, don't sneak out of the house. You could get kidnapped or don't walk by yourself in the dark. You could get kidnapped or I mean, it was almost like it was a consequence of not obeying could happen. Not that not necessarily that like my my parents threatened me with that. They certainly never did. But just the way that I felt like it was taught or talked about in general, I felt like that was kind of implied. Yeah. And the thought of someone breaking into my home, I mean, the place that I thought was most secure on earth, just never, never really seemed like it could actually happen. Yeah. Not with my family all asleep around me, my parents, you know, asleep as well. Like that just, didn't seem like it would happen or it could happen, but yet that's exactly what did happen. I mean, I was in a pretty deep sleep when all of a sudden I heard this voice and it seemed just so outrageous and shocking that I couldn't immediately accept that it was real. Mm. And uh, this man, he repeated the same words again. He said, I have a knife at your neck. Don't make a sound. Get up and come with me. And I mean, honestly, in that moment, like I just, you know, I didn't feel like I really had a choice. I felt like I had to do exactly as he said. And, and so I did. And I remember he took me up into the mountains to this hidden campsite where um, he ended up raping me and chaining me up and doing all sorts of pretty, pretty horrific like abuse and sexual abuse and he had this way I mean we could spend a really time a really long time talking about it but he had found that the best way to manipulate people and the best people the best way to get what he wanted or justify what he wanted was by using religion everything that he did to me 
he would phrase it as God commanded me to do this. I don't want to do this. I would never hurt a child, but God commanded me to do this. When in reality, like he did, he just wanted to rape little girls. Yeah. And yeah. whole plan where he was going to kidnap seven little girls. I just was the first. And um, I mean, he did actually try a few more times while I was held captive to go out and kidnap other girls and thank heavens. Um, he was never successful. I remember each time he went out, I was so worried and concerned because I would feel very, very guilty because I was alone. Yeah. And I was hurting and I was miserable and I wanted a friend. I wanted someone else to be there with me. So I felt terrible that I wanted someone else in that situation with me yeah. because I knew I didn't want anyone else to go through what I'd already been through. And then there was this other side of, of emotion that really made me question like my integrity as yeah. an individual. I mean, if he successfully brought another girl back into camp like was I just gonna stand aside and let him do to her the same thing that he did to me right. or I mean was there anything I could even do anyway I was 14, 14. when he kidnapped me and yeah. then I turned 15 uh, while I was in captivity with him sure as an adult I can look back and be like if he made up his mind to rape another girl like you couldn't have stopped him. Yeah. But I think if he had been successful, I think that is a lot of like guilt I would have felt for years. You you talk a lot about the fear that you were feeling. Like. Yes. I mean, every time like he threatened me with something, it was a very real threat. He didn't make empty threats. And I mean, he made threats all the time and some of them like he definitely did follow through and sometimes I was like I, I'll do whatever it takes to not have this threat come to fruition and honestly that's really how I ended up making my choices was was based off of if I do this will I survive if I don't do this will I survive and that's kind of how I navigated my my way through my captivity and it kind of got to a point where I almost didn't even have to ask myself that question anymore because I just knew. I knew what was expected of me and I knew what would happen to me if I didn't do. Yeah. So, I mean, he didn't always have to expressly say, if you don't do this, then I'm going to starve you for a week or I'm going to uh, force you to go naked for days on end. Or, I mean, like he followed through plenty yeah. for me. To, to help me understand that this was that these were very real threats they weren't just empty threats yeah it's interesting you talk about how he used religion to justify at least in his mind his behavior but as i like as i read and learned about your story like i don't know you didn't really fall for that you you it seems like you kind of saw through that i know you felt the weight of the the threats the violence but not the the religious rationalization did you ever really fall for that or did you see through it i feel like i was fortunate enough in my upbringing that my parents always stressed that you'll know a person by their actions actions speak louder than words yeah so even though like he'd say well god commanded me to do this or god commanded me to do that or you know this is what i'm supposed to be doing his actions like they were hurting me. They were hurting my family. Like I couldn't make any choices. I didn't get to choose like when I ate or if I ate or what I got to eat or yeah. if I had water to drink or if I got to sleep or if even if I got to go to the bathroom. I mean, I didn't have any like choice in the matter. And what he did like always hurt me, hurt my family. And so in that respect, it always made me feel like this is not the God that I was raised to believe in. Yeah. And this is not the God that I feel like I've tried to come to know. Yeah. So for me, kind of having that base of of my whole life being told actions speak louder than words, I kind of felt like that helped me stay true to to myself and mm -hmm. recognize that what they were doing was just manipulating other people yeah. and yeah I got to witness it a lot and I saw them lie a yeah. lot 
And so it just always seemed pretty clear to me that they were just a couple of really big fat liars. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Your parents prepared you. And I mean, I'm sure that that never in their wildest dreams or nightmares would they think that they were preparing you for that, but they did. It seems like they did prepare you well to see the truth from the lies, like even, even at 14. So man, your 15th birthday, what happened? Did you, I, I was impressed in the, again, in reading your story, like you, I can't remember like uh, by Tuesday, what I did on the weekend, but like you were able to remember the, just the progression of time. Do you remember your birthday during that season? I mean, at the time that I wrote the book, yeah, I remember it now. I might need yeah. to go back and reread the book to remember. <laughs> but when you, when you were in captivity, did you like wake up one day and go, oh my gosh, I'm 15 today. Like, did you remember? Oh, that? yeah, I was aware of, of time and I knew, I knew what day was my birthday. I knew what day was Thanksgiving. I knew what day was Christmas. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Wow. There's a really profound resiliency that I see and and I've seen it in other stories of like the survivors that we've come to know over the years, just a real internal innate toughness and tenacity. It, it sounds like you, yeah, it was survival mode is what it was most of the time, wasn't it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. the I think the most haunting part, aside from actually being taken from your you know, from your parents' home. But the, I think the other part that was really haunting in your stories later in the story towards the end of your captivity, when you were in town and you, and I, I tried to find it before we came on here and I, I couldn't find the exact spot, but you you talk, talked about you were wearing a veil, right? He mm -hmm. had to wear a veil and the pleading with your eyes when you would look at people and and you would, did you see them turn away? Like, what was that experience like for you? to know that you couldn't say anything. All you had was your eyes to communicate a message. What was that like? Actually, I find it a bit ironic, really, mm -hmm. because these days, if you wore something covering the lower half of your faith, people wouldn't think twice, mm -hmm. uh, thanks to COVID. Right, right. Uh, but back then, it wasn't long after 9-11 happened. And I felt like at the time, and, and I mean, I could be wrong, I was just a kid, but my memory certain, certainly seemed to tell me that like people were just extra sensitive to any form of perceived extremism. Mm. And so when people would see us out in public, I mean, they, they kept away from us. And, and honestly, I think that's why my captors had us dress the way that we were dressed and why they had us act the way that we acted was to keep people away. I think they knew, they recognized that extremism scared people. And, and so they capitalized on that. Mm. And I mean, I remember the, one of the times I was taken out in public, we were walking down a sidewalk and there were people who were walking towards us and they stopped when they saw us and they crossed the street to the other side to walk by us. And then when they were a ways past us, they crossed back to the same side. I mean, I remember someone multiple times actually sticking their head outside of their cars and yelling Osama at us as they drove by. Wow. Uh, I mean, it was, it was hard because, and I feel like I have maybe some kind of compassion towards the people that acted the way that they did. I don't think anyone ever thought like the Twin Towers could come down and, and right. yet they did. Right. And I think that scared a lot of people. And so part of me is like, okay, like you're not used to seeing. Yeah dressing or acting a certain way I could understand how that would you'd put your guard up to that yeah but like for me like that just felt devastating because I just you know I wanted to be saved I wanted to be rescued and yeah. and I was like trying to like make eye contact with people and trying to I don't know send a message just with my eyes and it ended up scaring people and so that yeah. was that was devastating yeah yeah so it was nine months of that hellish experience what was the moment when when you were actually rescued what was that like for you actually the day that i was rescued i mean looking back yes it's 
you know, such a miracle in my life. And it was incredible. Like it was everything I ever wanted coming back home to my family. But the actual like interaction with the police when they first approached us. Honestly, it was scary. I had been very, you know, I'd been very abused. I had been very threatened. And then the police officers, I mean, they were very aggressive, honestly, in their questioning of me as well. I did not know them. I did not know what they were capable of. I didn't know if they could actually protect me, but I knew what my captors were capable of. And I knew what they had threatened me with. And I knew what they would do if the situation worked out in their control as it always had done in the past. Right. So it was actually a pretty stressful day, very stressful moment, my initial rescue. And, and eventually when I was taken away from my captors and put in the police car, I mean, I was handcuffed. So I did then think, oh my gosh, like I've done something wrong. Yeah. I'm in trouble. Maybe they don't believe me. Like, <sighs> I don't, what did I say? Like, what did I do? Should I have just kept my mouth shut? Should I not have said anything? Do you know why they handcuffed you? You know, it's interesting. I recently just had the opportunity to re-meet the officers that rescued me, yeah. which like I have crazy enough in all my time, like being an advocate and like speaking out and being involved. I have never crossed paths with them until recently. And I asked them that question. They're like, but we weren't the ones that actually handcuffed you. It was this other officer who's not here. Oh, wow. <laughs> but they were just like, we didn't know what you were capable of. We didn't mm -hmm. know what you'd been through. We didn't know if you were going to be aggressive. We didn't know, like, we just didn't know. And, you know, people in the back of the car at that time period, like, if you were in the back of the car, you were handcuffed, like, yeah. and you hadn't been forthcoming with your answers. So, I mean, you were very difficult when we questioned you. We didn't know what to do. And listening to their perspective, like part of me is like, okay, I could see maybe how you'd be like, I, like, I have no idea what this girl's been through. I have no idea what protocol is because I genuinely don't think anyone ever thought that I was going to come back alive. Wow. I think... Most officers involved in my case thought if they ever found me, they would only find a body. Mm. I don't, they were prepared to find me alive. No. And so I don't think protocol had been discussed. What do we do if we find her alive? It was more like when we find her dead, we will do. Yeah. They had a plan for that. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So I, I, I got to believe. It, it it probably felt for you like, okay, I've just, I've gone from being captive here and now I'm captive here. A little bit. I thought I was going to jail. I thought I was <sighs> in trouble. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Obviously that, that didn't happen. Uh, you, you came home the, you know, the, the stories of, you know, you being reunited with your family. It's just like heartbreaking in a good way. I just said like, as a dad, I'm like, I can't imagine you know, can't imagine what your mom and dad were were feeling in that moment. And the 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 most curious thing for me about you and that story is like, okay, and now you're 15, and what was it like to just try to reintegrate back into the normal world of a 15 year old after what you had been through? <laughs> I mean, I remember that night I came home, my parents asked me what I wanted to do. And I was like, I want to see my friends and I want to go to school tomorrow. And like, I think I had some pretty severe FOMO. My parents were like, oh, you, you can't go to school tomorrow. Just finish the school year at home. And then in the fall, you can go back to school. Yeah. And I mean, I like initially I was like, but I want to go now. Like I want to, like I've already missed so much. Like yeah. I want to go see my friends and I want to make up for lost time. So like I was very anxious to get back to all the things that I felt like I was missing out right. on. Right. Uh, and when I eventually did start high school, I think that there were a lot of people that just didn't 
know how to respond to me. Yeah, so, what was that like? So maybe they kept me at arm's distance just because they didn't know. They didn't yeah. know what to do or how to act around me. And then there were people, I mean, I went to a pretty large high school and like there would be people who I would walk down the hallway and they just like call out my name to see if I turned, if I would turn to see if it was really me. It was all right. Like eventually time passed and I think probably like the novelty, I think it kind of worn off. And I mean, people who had been my friends before they were still my friends. And I'm I did make new friends. And I think people like quickly realized the more time they spent with me that like I was just a kid. Like I yeah. was, you know, I wanted all the same things that they wanted. And I think initially people were really worried that maybe they would like hurt my feelings or like I think maybe they felt like they were walking on eggshells around me a little bit initially. And I remember like as people would get to know me, I'd be like, believe me, like my two captors like didn't completely break and shatter me. Like, I don't think you can. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, wow. So how did you in the, you know, as you, as you came out of that experience into high school and, and beyond, how did you navigate the the trauma of that experience? How did you navigate that? I mean, you might almost even just call it stubbornness mm. because while I was kidnapped, I felt like all the dreams that I had for my life had been taken away from me. Mm. And I felt like all of my, all of the ability to make decisions were, were taken away from me. Mm. And so when I came back, I mean, like I wanted to have like the high school experience. I I wanted to get my driver's license. I wanted to go to dances. I wanted to do the cross country team. It lasted for like two weeks, but like <laughs> those two weeks, it was great. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, there were like, I, I wanted mm -hmm. all the things that I felt had been taken away from me. Yeah. And so I was very excited about experiencing them. And I mean, there were hard times. Like I'd be lying if I was like, oh, I never had a hard day since then. Yeah. Um, I definitely did. And I don't know, sometimes just like having a calm place to sit and sift through my emotions was helpful. Or, I mean, I grew up playing the harp mm -hmm. and I felt like sometimes like if I couldn't articulate how I felt. I felt like I could play how I felt. Yeah. And not even that, like, I was, am still by no means, like, I am not a virtuoso at all. Like, yeah. my ability at the time was like what you'd expect from a high school student. But it still, it still helped being outside, getting away from whatever was going on was, was really nice. My parents used to have a cabin up one of the canyons surrounding Salt Lake. And it always felt like such a nice escape mm. to to go there and just feel like in a good way, not a bad way, but feel like nobody could find me there or yeah. nobody could like, I don't know, bring up hurtful things there. Yeah, That was really nice. It felt like a, a refuge and it was like a place that I felt like I could go or my parents would take me that like allowed me to feel how I felt and then kind of go back to finding my sense of equilibrium and being able to come back down yeah. and face whatever it was I needed to face. You still play the harp? Not as much as I would like to. Okay. My daughter, she was in the Nutcracker and as parents, we were supposed to volunteer <laughs> uh, hours contribute hours, service hours. And so my service was playing prelude music. Oh, wow. And that was for like, I don't know, was it a week and a half, two weeks every night? And I yeah. felt like that's the most playing I've done in, <laughs> in quite a while, but it makes me feel like I need to get it back. I need yeah. to start being more consistent with practicing. Oh, that's great. That's great. I think the what impresses me there's a lot of things that impress me about about your story and just kind of where you've gone with it. It's the resilience. It's just, yeah, that that innate stubbornness that I think is a part of who you are. But then you grew up, you're married, you're a wife, you're a mother, you're doing all of the things that 
so many people just they, they just do it. It's just it's really normal. But you also, in addition to all of that, you took that experience and all of that trauma and you focused it into your foundation. And you've spent how many years now? The Elizabeth Smart Foundation started when? It was it was 2011. So 12, coming up on 13 years, uh, I guess. It's ironic. Same age as Epic. Same. So, so tell us about that work. Tell us about what you're doing. What's the scope of it? What's your vision for that work? Yeah. So, you know, when I first came back, I felt so much shame and embarrassment around all the sexual abuse that I experienced. And I, I didn't want people to know that I had been raped or that I had been like sexually abused. And like looking back, <laughs> I'm, I'm not saying it's laughable to have thought that, but like at the same time, anyone who would have heard even part of my story would have just naturally assumed that that I had been raped. Yeah. But I thought, I mean, for years, I thought I could hide it. Of course, that was unrealistic. But then also, I didn't hear people talk about it back then. It wasn't just something that came up in common conversation. And as time went on, well, initially, I felt like I was alone. I felt like nobody else could understand what I'd been through. I felt like it was like so shameful, even though in my mind, I knew it wasn't my fault, but my, like my heart and my emotions did not align with what my mind told me. And so as time went on, I just felt like, I felt like I came to this place where I was like, no, like I'm going to own this. Like this did happen to me and I'm not embarrassed of it. And if anyone thinks less of me for it, then they don't deserve to know me because like this, this doesn't make me any less deserving or lovable than, than anyone else. And I think I felt shocked as time went by because I had so many people coming up to me and disclosing their abuse to me. I mean, I don't even think today I could put a number on wow. the amount of people who have come up to me and disclosed their abuse to me. I imagine they came up to you after you shared your story at at an event or something. Yeah, or even like when I go grocery shopping. Oh, wow. Like, I have people disclose, yeah, their abuse to me all the time. And and I felt like it just made me so, I don't think angry is the right word, but just like passionate Mm. about, I guess, changing the narrative because it is so common. And I think it's been shocking for me to realize it was definitely shocking to me when I realized just how common sexual assault and sexual violence and rape was. I I couldn't believe it. And even to this day, for example, there are so many wonderful causes. And I'm so grateful that so many people feel passionate about each individual cause because like, like I don't have the energy or bandwidth to take on everyone's cause. So I'm so grateful that everyone has a cause. But in light of this conversation, I was on an airline that shall remain nameless. But they do a breast cancer awareness campaign in October. Mm-hmm. And I was sitting on the flight and they came on and they're saying, you know, if you have spare change, if you want to donate, which I think is great. I mean, a lot of people who I care a lot about very deeply have experienced breast cancer and it's a horrific, terrible disease. And I'm like, I'm I'm not saying I'm not grateful. I'm absolutely grateful that this airline has taken on this cause. But as I was sitting there, they came on and they said, well, one in six women is like statistically is going to experience breast cancer. And as I sat there, I was thinking, well, one in five women is sexually abused nationwide. And in Utah, that's one in three. Oh. And a person is sexually abused every 73 seconds. That's almost one a minute. And every nine minutes, that person is a child. Oh. I mean, it's about a million women a year who Did are you jump up and grab the microphone from the stewardess at that point. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm I'm grateful that they do that because yeah. like I said, breast cancer is horrific and I don't have the bandwidth to take up every cause. Right. But I was just sitting there thinking about it and 
Like this is a hard cause to take on. This is a hard topic. Once the damage has been done, yeah, it can't be undone. That's part of that person's story for the rest of their life. And it has stolen something from them that really can never be replaced. Yeah. And I think when I got to this point of realizing that, I just felt like, if not me, then who else? Yeah. And I'm not going to feel ashamed over what happened to me. Like, I did not consent to that. Yeah. That was not my choice. That's nobody's choice. Nobody would consent to being raped. It, it wouldn't be rape if you consented to it. And so that just really made me want to make a difference. And so at the Elizabeth Smart Foundation, we have... A few different programs. One of them is called Smart Defense, and it is a trauma-informed self-defense program that combines Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, Krav Maga, and Muay Thai. And so it is it is physical, but it's all yeah. based upon being trauma-informed. And our my director, my program director, like she could probably kill me with like her pinky. She is the real deal and I adore her and love her. And she is also a survivor and she'll be the first one to tell you that even if you go through a training, there is no 100% guarantee that this won't happen to you. She said, you know, this could still happen to me tomorrow, even though here I am, here she is. You know, she's like five time world champion for her weight class in Brazilian jiu-jitsu. I mean, like, and she's done cage fighting and, and everything. Like, even she will say, you know, there's there's just no guarantee. There it might be that one person that's just so strong that, you know, you can't fight back. But she talks so much about recognizing that we are all so much stronger than we think we are. One of my favorite things as we've gone through and piloted this program and as I've gone through and like watched other um, women and girls come through our program is the first day when she tries to have the women scream, we rarely have an individual scream like at a hundred percent of their volume. Usually yeah. it's like, 50% because it feels awkward, because it feels unnatural, because you probably weren't raised to, to raised use the voice. loudest voice. Yeah. I think like you're raised to be polite and kind and like don't talk so loud and use your indoor voice. And and so it's really almost in direct conflict to what you've been taught your entire life. And so it's incredible to see like from the beginning of the class to the end of class, the increase in volume. And then also like, you know, I have seen women come through, women and girls come through who were like so tiny. They look like you could just like knock them over with a feather or, you know, they've been pregnant or they've been dealing with an injury. And yet each one of these women and girls is so strong and so powerful. And I know because I've personally held the mats for them as they've yeah. like, as they've struck the mats or need yeah. the mats. I mean, like they're strong. And I think it goes a long way to realize, Hey, like I know how to strike. Yeah. I know how to knee someone. Like I, like, maybe I don't remember everything that was taught in this class, but I know that I have a tool. And that's what we want them to know. Yeah. We want them to know that they they do have tools. And even if in that moment they freeze or they don't respond, they didn't do anything wrong. That's just their natural, that's just their natural response kicking in. Yeah. Uh, it's just more tools. Yeah. Tools give you the opportunity to get away because that is the ultimate goal. It's right. it's not to kill the person. I mean, like if that <laughs> happens, I'm not going to cry. I might yeah. applaud you, but yeah. like, we don't want you to just like to stay and fight them. Yeah. We want you to know enough to get away safely. Get away. Is this school-based? So we do have it in a couple of universities. Okay. It's become an accredited class. In a few universities here in Utah, we are working continually on expanding and growing it outside of Utah as well. And then one of my favorite campaigns that we do every year is called We Believe You. And we run it all November long. It's all year long, but our big push for it is in, in November because I think probably the most common when someone discloses their abuse to me, the most common 
comment that goes alongside it is I was scared nobody would believe me or yeah. nobody did believe me. Yeah. And so I've never told anyone this or I've never sought further help because right. of this. And like that breaks my heart because they shouldn't have to carry around this huge heavy weight for the rest of their life. I mean, there's so many like kind, loving, wonderful people and organizations that have dedicated time, resources, like everything to help survivors. Yeah. And so this campaign is helping survivors to know that they're not alone, that there are other survivors in this world that have been through something similar. And it's also to provide education to communities because how difficult is it to respond when someone tells you about something really terrible in their life? I mean, I think all of us are like, oh, this is like really awkward. I don't know what to say. Like, I want to say something that'll like help you, but I don't want to hurt you. And I think a lot of people really struggle with that. So with this campaign as well, you know, we talk about how to respond compassionately without questioning them or trying to fix them. Yeah. Um, just knowing that we're there for them, that we support them, that we love them, that we will follow their lead. You know, yeah. if they want someone to go with them to the police station to report, like we will do that. If they just want to go on a walk and have a friend, like we're there for them or get ice cream or maybe find a therapist or I don't know, join like a, I don't know, I get group fitness class. I don't know. It could be anything. Yeah. Yeah. It's just believing them and supporting them. That's such a simple and yet like really profound idea just to say that we believe you. And I saw that on your website, read a little bit about it. And it was chilling for me because the one time in my life I got called to jury duty, it was a rape case. And during jury selection, I forget what, what the term is for that, the the defense attorney asked asked me he was asking everybody if a woman says that she was raped are you inclined to believe her and it was just to me it seemed like really self-evident i was like yeah why would you say it if it wasn't true you know like it, to me it was like duh yeah and so i said yes and he turned to the judge and he said i i moved to dismiss juror number 11 or whatever i was and so i was kicked off the jury pool at that point, because I said, yes, I am inclined to believe one. Well, months later, I think I, I ran into the the prosecuting attorney who at the time attended the same church I was at. And she goes, if you had stayed on the jury, if they'd kept you on the jury, we maybe would have got this guy. But his his case was thrown out. Isn't that tragic? Because, yeah, yeah it's only one out of a thousand predators actually ever sees a day of prison, like yeah. is ever successfully prosecuted like how tragic is that one out of a thousand and like like these crimes sex crimes are are so devastating and I feel like one of the saddest things I see is when a survivor when there's a survivor involved like sex crimes there's just something so heinous and they just violate you at such a deep level of your soul that too often I feel like I watch survivors, even though they're still living and breathing, they're not actually living, mm. if that makes sense. I mean, yeah. they're scared to be who they were before it happened. They're scared to leave their house. They're scared to enjoy relationships or, or build new friendships. And, and they're really scared to ever become intimate with someone ever again. And I mean, I get that. I totally yeah. get that. Yeah. It's, it's devastating. I think that's one of the saddest things that I see is this yet, loss of life while the person is still living. And, this, and yet this simple statement the simple declaration i believe you can be a, a starting point for healing right absolutely i think it like if someone tells you and you're the first person they tell hmm. i think how you respond really can set the trajectory as to whether or not they go and and report it or seek professional help or move towards like a happy healthier place versus keeping it bottled up inside of them and just having to end up destroy them from the inside out. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I know this like from the work we've done at Epic, the simple acts like that. It's really simple 
wisdom and and really the the gift of simply being present showing up in people's lives like that that is so profoundly powerful in so many different ways i i I got a couple, I have several more questions, but I want to know, like, for the Elizabeth Smart Foundation, what's the vision for you with with these programs? Are there other things that you're looking at that that are coming that that you're excited about? There is always something I'm excited yeah. about that I could talk on for hours about. One of them is that I have. So the Elizabeth Smart Foundation has a sister organization called the Maloof Foundation, and we our goals and our desires they all align. And one of the programs that they have that I love, and I think everyone should take it is called on watch and if you go to iamonwatch.org it's a free training that i mean total it's maybe an hour maybe a little bit under an hour but it's a series of videos that teaches you how to recognize signs of human trafficking and what to do and even beyond human trafficking like i think there's so much good information that if you just pay attention to it you'll be able to recognize just signs of abuse period yeah um but it's like it's free. And when people are like, well, what can I do today? I'm like, go take this training, go sign up and go take it right now. And then tell everyone else, you know, to go take it and have these conversations because abuse, as much as you think would be obvious or trafficking, as much as you think it'd be obvious, it's not. Then it yeah. happens in bad neighborhoods and it happens in nice hotels and not nice hotels. I mean, like it happens everywhere. And I think the more informed we are, the more likely we are to recognize it and yeah. hopefully eventually like turn the tables. Let's start changing the statistics. We live in such an incredible world and people are so smart like I'm continually like just amazed at like what people come up with or how creative they are and I just think we live in a world and I really do believe that there are more good people than bad people if we're all coming together and we're putting our minds to this topic and we're paying attention and we are just committing ourselves to being aware like is it unreasonable to think that we could see the statistics change mm -hmm. and like is it unreasonable to think that like in our lifetime we could see we could see real change we could see understanding we could see compassion we could see this change in culture where it's gone from what i feel like is fear and shame based to like encouragement and compassion yeah. and security and what an incredible what an incredible world this would be if we're able to do that and and i think we can yeah yeah i yes amen <laughs> <laughs> I think that kind of audacious hope is right on. It's spot on. It's infectious. It's yeah. I love hearing that. I am. Yeah, I'm excited. Now you guys are, are you co-sponsoring the, the event with Nikosi in August? Is that is yes. else another yes. project? So it's Yes, it's with my sister foundation, the Maloof Foundation. We have like a formal agreement. So we are very much joined and very much in line. But the official partner is, yes, Maloof Foundation. Okay. But I'm so excited because this is an opportunity to talk about these issues on such a large and national and, and maybe international yeah. Yeah. scale. And like get the word out there and just give an opportunity to educate and enlighten and frankly enlist people mm. to this cause because yeah. whether you consciously know someone like who's come out and told you like I was raped or I was sexually abused or I was trafficked or you've never had someone tell you that like statistically you definitely know someone like 100 percent right, you know right. Someone, unless you were born yesterday who has been sexually abused in your yeah. life yeah you you will know someone that's yeah yeah i have three daughters and i think the statistic i heard one time it was one in four i think and like it was just chilling for me to realize like oh my gosh and we've had i think in, my wife and i've been married 40 years we've had seven in addition to our daughters seven additional young women like live with us at you know for different seasons and just to think about you know yeah think about the world so this is the thing that 
I don't have trouble going to sleep. I have trouble staying to sleep. This is the thing that wakes me up at night. And it is the question, how did we get here? How did we get to a world where this kind of thing is so commonplace, so normal? And I think you said as much in the booklet that Brian David Mitchell was a, you know, he was a sociopathic, narcissistic pedophile. I think you use other, you know, descriptive terms. So in some ways, he's kind of an outlier, but just the notion that men have oftentimes like unfettered access to women's bodies to do it. It's just what guys do. How did we get here? How did we get to this place in our world where this is such a normal thing, where women are not believed when they disclose that they've been sexually assaulted or raped or trafficked? Like, how do you think we got here? That's a great question. This is a really difficult topic. And I think it's a topic that people don't feel comfortable talking about. Like, you just don't want to believe because yes you can say don't talk to strangers you can say oh you know like don't let anyone touch you where your swimsuit sits good touch bad touch i mean you can say that all you want but this is a crime that like it's truly outside of your control it's not a consequence of of your actions right right I, I think that's really hard for people to process because you always want to think, well, if that ever happened to me, I would do this or I would do that or that would never happen to me. And I think our brains are constantly wanting to build distance between us and whatever scary act or harm that our brain perceives. And this certainly is an incredibly hellish, nightmarish act. And so I think our brains just naturally want to distance us from that. And then and then as we look at people, I mean, whether we want to admit it or not, we are constantly judging every person around us mm-hmm. all the time. I mean, based off of appearance, based off of interaction. And yeah. that's honestly how we keep ourselves safe. And when we live in a world where so many of these high profile people who are powerful, who are leaders in our country or leaders in business, when those stories come to light, I think it forces us to realize that our judgments are wrong. And I I think that's really kind of hard to come to terms with. I mean, maybe talking about it right now, you'd be like, yeah, yeah. But actually like living it and experiencing it and being like, wow, that means I need to be suspicious of, mm. of everyone. And I don't want to be suspicious of everyone. I think it's almost like a safety, like pr- protection mechanism that that we just automatically do in our brains. And I could be dead wrong. Certainly like media has a huge impact on it. Like the pornography industry is just like skyrocketing right now. Yeah. Um, there's just so many unrealistic expectations of what intimacy really truly is. And then I feel like, I mean, even as like a young girl myself, I look back on my childhood and it was like, oh, well, you need to make sure you cover up and you make sure you sit with your legs like together all the time. Like like the nonverbal message that I was getting was like, it's your fault if something uh, happens to yeah. you because boys can't control themselves. Right. And frankly, like, I feel like men should be so offended by that. Like, are you saying that they only like think with like their little head, not their big head? Like, are you saying like they don't have brains? Cause I'm like, I'm married to a man and like, I've got four brothers and like my dad and like, Every single one of them has a brain and every single one of them is intelligent and caring and compassionate. And I think it is such a disservice to men to be like, women, you need to dress this way because men can't control themselves. But I think also having this narrative being around for a long time, it, it does affect men. And I mean, I think back even on before I was married, I went on a date once and this guy at the end of our date, he was like, well, Elizabeth, you were raped so many times. Like, I remember like when he said that, I was like a little bit taken back. I was like, wow, I did not know we were going here. Wow. This is on a date. First or second date. Wow. He finally said, did you ever just like lie back and enjoy it? Oh my God. And I was so shocked 
at the time that first yeah. of all, he would have like the gall to ask me that on a date, but then yeah. even more so how he could think that like you ever just lie back and enjoy rape. And then he went on, he said, cause I think if I was being raped and there was nothing I could do about it, I think I would just probably lay back and enjoy it. And for me, like at that time, like I was like shocked and horrified, but as I've thought more on that experience since that time, part of me is just kind of like, what has society told you to yeah. like make you feel like, oh, it's fine. I should be enjoying this. Any sex act is a good act. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think like what we see with sex buyers and, and the work that we do, it's an entitlement. This is something that we are as men, and I'm, I'm speaking I'm presuming to speak for all men, but like we're raised in a culture that says this is something that we are entitled to. And yeah, it, it's baked in from an early age, I think. But that's that was the last date, right? With that guy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that. I, I, I did not marry him. <laughs> no, I can't imagine. I can't imagine that. I get asked a lot of times when I talk about trafficking and it's an honest very predictable response from parents. I bet you've seen this too. It's like, how do we keep our kids safe? That's a, a very common question. And actually, like the work you do is a brilliant answer to that. It's like, okay, there's a couple things. But my my response more often than not these days from parents, just from people who say, how do we keep our kids safe, is to say, raise safe sons. I think it starts early. Now, you, I know you have a daughter. Do you have sons as well? I have, yes, I have a little boy. Yeah. As you look at him and, and the world that he's going to grow up into, like, the, how do you and your husband, what is it like to parent a son in this day and age, knowing what you know by direct? personal painful experience like what is that like for for you guys as parents parenting terrifies me period boys and girls yeah like they both terrify me <laughs> but like for me i feel like i try to talk a lot about like respect and respecting other people like and i my girls it's the same thing you know like if someone tells you don't touch them if someone tells you don't do this yeah. then then don't do it and i mean we talk like we talk about, like this is, we talk about bodies we, and we use the correct body parts names and we try not to associate shame or negativity around any specific body part. And we try to be like really open and have consistent ongoing conversations with them. Like I'll be the first to admit, like, honestly, it's probably harder for me than it is for them. These days, my kids just like roll their eyes at me and they're like, we know mom, we know we've heard it all. <laughs> I'm like, but do you, do you know? Do you know? Um, yeah. oh, so what's the, how old are your kids? My oldest is eight and okay. then my little boy's six and my baby girl's five. Okay. And I mean, they're kids, they fight and they want the same toy and all the same things I'm sure most parents go through. Yeah. But I mean, like, I think as a parent, all you can do is keep trying, keep having the same conversation, even while your kids are rolling their eyes. Yep. And I think you talk about safe behavior and talk about, you know, trusting like your gut instinct. Yeah. Um, just ignore it. Because, yeah, I, I mean, not to go down like too far a rabbit hole yet again. I'm really good at going down rabbit holes. I think there's a lot of pressure to like be polite. And I think a lot of time the pressure to be polite, like overwhelms the nap, like listening to your natural instinct. You're like, it's more important for me to be like kind and polite because this person, like they probably won't do anything. They probably, they probably just are curious. But I think trying to encourage our kids to listen and trust their gut instinct. If they don't want to hug someone, mm, let yeah. them make that decision. Don't force them yeah. to hug that person. They don't want to engage like in school. They should engage in learning. But I mean, like where they have the safe opportunity to like say, I don't want this, respect their respect their decision. Like don't just force them to mm -hmm. because that's like during childhood that's when we model behavior and and what they can learn to expect in later life so if they say i don't want to do this and you say well you know you have to and granted i will say there are times when that is appropriate yeah. or like going to school i mean like my kids 
not every morning do they just like shoot out of bed and they're like, woohoo, let's go to school. Yeah. Um, there are mornings that I feel like I have to drag them out of bed, kicking and screaming figuratively <laughs> <laughs> and get them to school. But I feel like there are also times where, I mean, you can talk with them and you can be like, look, there are some things that we all have to do. Like school is something we have to do, but I, I don't know, come play like basketball with us and you don't want to, then you can say, well, you know, I don't really feel like it right now. And that's okay. We should respect that decision instead of just being like, no, you have to come play and force them to, because if that's the kind of behavior that we are you know, introducing them to as kids, yeah. then what are boundaries going to mean to them when they get older? Boundaries are going to be meant to be broken instead right. of... Which which creates vulnerability for the very thing that you and I, you know, deal with all the time. Yeah. And it also teaches them that other people's boundaries aren't important either. Yeah. You said parenting terrifies you and that's very astute. And I would just from an old parent to a young parent, like if you don't get to that point, you're probably not doing it right. <laughs> it, sh it should be a little, it should be a little bewildering and terrifying at, at times, but yeah. Wow. You said your son is the oldest. My daughter's the oldest. Daughter's my the little oldest. boy's the middle child. Okay. Have you thought at all about what it will be like when your oldest daughter turns 14? Like, I mean, I think about it right now, like yeah. little girl is almost the same age that my sister was who shared a bed with me the night that I was kidnapped, who saw me Wow. be kidnapped so yeah i i do think about it and like i look at her and i think oh she is like she's so innocent i want to protect her from this world and i don't want her to have to see like the ugly side of things and i want to like keep this innocence always but also like at the same time like i think well I think I think it was said, and don't quote me exactly, but I feel fairly confident in saying that I feel like I saw statistics that, that said like a child's first exposure to pornography, the average age, age is eight and my daughter's eight. And I'm like, yeah. who yeah. could possibly show my little eight-year-old girl pornography? And yeah. I think the very truth is, is that our kids are exposed to so much more than what we think they are exposed to. And I think the best piece of parenting advice that I've gotten is that when your child starts asking questions, that's the right time to start talking about it. Mm -hmm. And I have to admit, like my, I have a love-hate relationship with that advice because I think it's really good advice, but it's also led me to having conversations that I personally did not feel ready to have yet. Yeah, I think that, again, is a pretty common parenting experience. Yeah, I just want to say for the record, like, I'm not a parenting expert. Like, this is advice people have shared with me that yeah. I, that like struck a chord with me. Like, yeah. I am like everyone else, just trying to do the best that I can and learn as I go. Do you feel like you've ever been ready, like really ready for the challenges of parenting? No. no it's like no one is. And if, no. they tell you that, if they tell you they are, they're lying, I think. We're I mean, never ready. Before I had my first, I think I felt like, oh, it's not going to be that bad. Like I was second of six. My youngest brother is like 11 years younger than me. So like I remember when he was born very clearly. And like I remember watching him and babysitting him and like... Like he and I have always been super close. And so like part of me was like, okay, like parenting, I'm sure will be more intense than this. But like, I'm like, I, I might be a little bit ahead of the curve. No, no. What a stupid thing to think. Welcome. Welcome. Yeah, that's, that's what I would say. Yeah, I, it's exactly my experience. Yeah, he talked about uh, exposure to porn. Like my grandson just turned eight. So like, you know, I had, I had three daughters, so that was kind of my world, you know, as a, as a young parent, but now with, I have two grandsons and just realizing like, holy cow, what are, what are they, what is the world they're growing up into? Like as a man, what is the world I'm handing off to my, you know, my son-in-laws, to my grandsons, you know, to young men, it's, it's a, it's a really chilling thing. There's so much, we talk a lot at Epic about 
the the toxic nature of the masculine culture you know toxic masculinity is a term that gets used a lot and and maybe overused in some cases but i it's it's a i think it's an accurate description because toxic things they they break down they tear things apart they destroy life so we talk about generative it's kind of the opposite of that things that bring life my i just have a couple questions left for you but like what is something and it it can be related to the work that you know that you're doing now or or completely unrelated but for you what are the life-giving things that that you are committed to and the things that are you know that you're drawn to it could be your harp you could say that that's totally fine but like what else what what's life-giving for you at this season as a young parent Um, i mean i feel like i i live for my kid i mean i feel like seeing them happy seeing them like safe and succeeding and like knowing that they are kind good people but yet willing to stand up for themselves if they need to like that's everything. Mm. That's everything to me. I feel like more than ever becoming a parent, like makes me feel all the more passionate about all the things that we do at the Elizabeth Smart Foundation, all the like advocacy that comes into my personal life around these topics. I feel like it's like I have three, I have the best three reasons in the world to keep on fighting in this fight. Mm-hmm. So they're yeah, they're they're everything to me. Yeah. I love being I love being at home. I love feeling like having a safe place yeah. or a place I feel safe in, a place that I feel like is my sanctuary, which I, I feel like is my home. Um like that's because this is really heavy work and certainly yeah. you know that as well. And I feel like it's it's important to have things to turn to, to like recharge and and be able to step away from the heaviness that is this work. So yeah, my family is the number one, the number one yeah. reason or the number one outlet, everything. Yeah. But also like, yeah, if I have the chance to play the harp, that's great. I certainly don't play it as much as I used to. I am a grade A idiot and I keep signing up for marathons. And in the beginning, I'm like, yeah, this is so great. Like, I feel so good. And then as I get closer and closer to peak week, I'm like, I'm exhausted. Why am I doing this? These long runs are killing me. Yeah. But crazy enough, like, I feel like there's so much time like running or that I spend alone in my head while I'm doing my runs. If that doesn't sound like I'm too crazy, no. I feel like it also like just kind of gives me a chance to like process all of the things that I'm feeling or think of things that I want to do or hope to achieve or like it's just like a good processing time yeah if you will how, how many have you completed i've done three so far i signed up for my fourth one which will be in february and currently i am thinking i am such an idiot <laughs> why did i think training through the holidays would be a good idea uh, yeah it's a whole different kind of training <laughs> 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 wow good for you i am i am a marathoner trapped in a football player's body so i can't I, I think I have the head for it and probably the heart for it. I just don't have anything else. But I, I like I, yeah, I admire that. Yeah, that, but that does take a lot. I get the I get the being in your head and having long times of, you know, just kind of silence. That's that's really good. That's really good. It's just so wonderful just to hear your story, like the the part that I read in the book, but to connect it with the the fuller part of where you are now. I just I, like I want to say how much I respect. It's, it is kind of a jujitsu move that you made at one point in your life, right? To take all that negative experience and turn that energy into something that I I think is a blessing for people that have suffered like you suffered and and I appreciate that I think it's I think it's also interesting that just how it overlaps even just a little bit with the larger you know the issue of of sexual exploitation and and trafficking and and so many of those stories they don't start or end like yours did but the 
but the experience of the person being victimized is very similar. And you like you, you have such hard earned insight into that, into what that trauma is like. We believe you campaign as well. I meant to ask you this too. I looked on the website. Do they sell shirts for guys or is it just for girls? We do. No, they right. absolutely do. All we right. do. I'm, I'm getting one. I'm getting one. I, I will wear it. I might just wear it. It's not exactly safe, but I might wear it when I go motorcycle riding because I, I tend to end up in places where guys think differently about those things. So maybe I'll I'll do that someday and wear it into a biker bar. If I do, if I do I'm going to send you a picture. I was just going to ask for one. Please do. Yeah, yeah. I will. I will send you a picture. So that's great. I just say it's our tradition only because we're just starting. But I want it to be our tradition that our guests have the last word. And I'm going to be a little selfish here. If you, if you could think of something hopeful and life giving and challenging that you would say to men that are listening to this, I think it's the same thing I'd say to women. Well, I guess it's kind of three things. The first thing of the three is everybody has a story. Everyone has something that they've been through and experienced. The second thing is that whatever it is that you've experienced, it doesn't have to define you. Ultimately, you define yourself by the way you live your life. All the little decisions that you make every single day, that's what defines who you are. And the third thing is it's important to take time to be happy. It's easy to always be chasing the next project, the next promotion, the next whatever. Yeah. It's really, really important to take time to enjoy your life, to find happiness, find the things that bring meaning and peace and joy and equilibrium into your life. And those are the things that I would share. Elizabeth Smart, you are a blessing. Thank you. Appreciate you. And thanks for taking the time. Well, thank you for having me, Tom. I'm so, I love what you're doing at Epic and I can't wait to see what the future holds. Yeah. And we'll, we'll, we will meet for sure in person in DC. I will be there this summer. Great. I can't wait. Yeah. All right. Thank you for listening to the Masculine Wilderness Podcast with your host, Tom Perez. This podcast is a production of Epic Project, a nonprofit organization dedicated to disrupting the demand for commercial sexual exploitation and dismantling the forces that perpetuate it. I'm your producer, Lauren Trantham. Special shout out to our favorite logo designer, Michelle Boucher, as well as Wes Finley, who crafted and donated our amazing theme song. Interested in sponsoring an episode? Send us an email at podcast at epicproject.org. That's podcast at epikproject.org. As a nonprofit organization, your donations allow us not only to produce this podcast and change the conversation around sexual exploitation, but also to manage our many programs, such as buyer intervention, teen prevention, and community education. Your support also allows us to support survivors of exploitation and more. To learn more about our work and to donate, visit www.epicproject.org. Once again, that is www.epikproject.org. Most importantly, this podcast would be nothing without you, the listener. Thank you for tuning in, subscribing, and sharing this episode with your friends and loved ones. Thank you for your commitment to learning more about the issues that affect our most vulnerable populations. Thank you for navigating this masculine wilderness with us. See you next episode.